welcome to my talk. So today we'll be discussing regarding the Awabakal language. Um, it's part of a project that I've been taking part in these past few months, and it's a very, very, very interesting story uh, in itself. So let's begin. Okay, before, we, before I begin, actually, I'd like you to um, take a look at the beautiful paintings uh, in these slides. They all come from the uh, Wallace album in the State Library of New South Wales, so that's my source. If you want to find out more about it, go to this website. It's fantastic. Okay, first things first. The language that, that um, is known as Awabakal uh, is spoken in southeast Australia, so that's the area just to the north of Sydney. If you look at... Um, the map okay this is a map of languages spoken in australia language families specifically and the huge yellow area where approximately 90 percent of the continent uh actually speaks languages from the same language family think of it like indo-european uh buralic uh sino-tibetan so this in australia this big ch yellow chunk of languages belongs to a family called pamanyungan all right and it's about 75%, more than 75% of all languages in Australia come from this massive family. And so Awabakal is one of these languages. Uh, it's spoken in the southeast around Sydney, and I'll show you the map. If, we, if you see the, the link uh, to, the, um, to the map below, right next to it, to the left, so it's your bottom right, I think, or bottom left, and you will be able to, uh, to see roughly the coastline just north of Sydney, uh, that's where it was spoken. Okay, now the Awabakal is also known as a language, it's also known as the Hunter River or Lake Macquarie language, and it went extinct in the late 19th century. That's right. So, so nobody has spoken this language since the late, probably the late 19th century. Um, it's, it's very important because this language was probably the first Aboriginal language in Australia to be fully, to be documented in any uh, detail by Europeans. And you can see here the map Newcastle, and there's the city of Lake Macquarie. If you go down south, an hour, hour and a half, you reach Sydney. Basically, that's where it's spoken. It was spoken, all right, across that area. Um, let's take a look. Okay, so uh, it, the language uh, use, it, it was actually the first Australian Aboriginal language to be documented in detail by Europeans. And if you look at the um, the the cover of the book on the left it's yes it's very long it's 19th century typical 19th century english um academic style and australian grammar comprehending the principles and natural rules of the language as spoken by the aborigines in the vicinity of hunters river lake macquarie uh, etc new south wales uh, by reverend lancelot edward threlkeld uh, a lot of the documents that we're using to reconstruct the language and the grammar come well, in fact from threlkeld's collection he was actually the first person to take down um recording not not to record of course recording equipment didn't exist in the early 19th century when he started so a little bit of history we'll, we'll go into that later on uh, so the reverend threlkeld actually wrote dictionaries he wrote grammars he wrote in fact a translation of the bible he was a missionary so his main objective was to translate the bible and introduce it to the um, people of australia starting with our bacal and this is another this is another um work by him it's a key to the structure of the aboriginal language the analysis of the particles uses affixes to form the various modifications of verbs showing the essential powers abstract roots and other peculiarities of the language spoken by the aborigines in the hunter river lake macquarie and new south wales by reverend lancelot edward threckel yes yes believe it or not in the 1820s 1830s right up to the end of the 19th century you'll find a lot of academic books have have titles like this right, so bear with me now who was reverend threkeld and how did he gain um, a, a knowledge a, a, a certain amount of knowledge regarding this language we're going to take a look this so this is uh, reverend threkeld and his informant who's a native awabakal speaker from the tribe uh, apparently a person of very high standing his name is biraban so Biraban was his informant. He was one who taught uh, Reverend Threlkeld uh, the language, his language, basically. This is about the 1820s, okay? Now, remember that Australia was basically colonized, or the first Europeans to settle in, in large numbers in Australia, started uh, going, uh, settling along the southeast coast in the late 17th century. So this is like a few decades after that, Reverend Threlkeld decided to document uh, the language spoken in uh, to the north of Sydney. 
Okay, so the documents, this is what it looks like. So uh, if you can see at the very top of the page, there's Biroban, name of person. So one of the most interesting things about it, if you can see, is his documents that, of course, being a 19th century, doc century document, the Reverend Thurkut was not trained in modern linguistic analysis. So none of the, the concepts that we, we consider, like morphology, syntax, all this stuff, he had a very completely different interpretation. So you're going to find a different uh, way of expressing and different ways of um, glossing that are, that are quite unique and quite difficult for reconstruction in many ways. We're going to take a look. All right. So um, if you look at the, the, the page on the left, you've got uh, NGDAV, that, that is actually nominative, genitive, dative, ablative, vocative, uh, and uh, sorry, accusative, vocative, ablative. Uh, right. Now, the, the weird thing is, of course, the Aboriginal languages do not actually have a case system like that. The reason why the case system uh, that is used in this grammar looks a bit like Latin is because Thrakel was educated in Latin. So he tried to make the language fit into his understanding, which is going to be a bit of a, as we will show you, as I will show you, it's actually uh, was quite a bit of a, ca a catastrophe, actually, as we go along. Let's, let's look at the next slide. Okay, so this is actually an introduction to the phonology of the language. All right, so um, so very typical of the 19th century, early 19th century, and 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 beyond that a little bit as well. Uh, a lot of the time, there's a, there's a massive amount of information dumping. So so Reverend Thrakel, before he went to uh, Sydney, uh, Newcastle, in Australia in the 1820s, was based in Polynesia. So he had acquired an understanding of languages like Tahitian and a few other Polynesian languages. And he actually compared them with the uh, Aboriginal language spoken in uh, Sydney, even though they're completely unrelated, phonology, completely different, everything. He tried to put them down in nice, very neat, uh, classical Greek, Latin-y looking uh, charts, basically. So if you look at the column, uh, if you look at page three, and you look at the the, the, the blue uh, column that I've, I've outlined in blue, that is basically the phonology of the Awabakal language, uh, what Thurgal assumed to be the phonology. Now, the problem is this. So um, coming in as the first European to actually study an ab Aboriginal language, he had no idea about the phonological uh, uh, peculiarities of this language. He had no idea uh, regarding, uh, for example, things like uh, basic morphology and word structure everything so we're gonna take a look and see that a lot of things were very detailed but a lot of things also detailed his lack of understanding we're gonna see uh, as we go along so if you look at the column you'll notice something interesting there are no fricative sounds if you look to the left and to the right those are mostly uh, Polynesian languages and so the Awabaka language has no F there's no S there's no Z okay there's no sh. All right, and, and this is interesting. This is very important because this is actually a feature of almost all Aboriginal languages, okay, in Australia, except those in the very far north, there's one language that has an S and a Z sound. That's because it's spoken so close to Papua New Guinea, to Torres Strait Islands, that has been influenced by Papuan languages and also the Austronesian languages of the area. That's the only one that has a S, Z sound. The other languages in Australia do not have fricative sounds. So there's no F, no S, no Sh, no Z. They do not exist. Uh, some languages have developed, but not, we suspect not our Bacal, but there's a possibility that neighboring languages might have this feature, is that certain sounds have become softer. So Lenitian, if you, if you know, uh, speak a bit of Gaelic, Go study, you know, um, Celtic languages, uh, uh, P T K B D G V V R, like you know, uh, a B can become a V, a, a D becomes a V, and, and a G becomes a R. Some languages have this, but those are secondary developments. The, the the languages do not have any underlying fricatives, as we know them, because that's a feat, that's, that's an interesting feature. And another feature is that he that we think existed in his language, but he misses out is that there are at least two R sounds. And this is very common in Australia. So there's a R, like R, R, R like, in, like in American English, R, okay, or Mandarin Chinese. There's a R, a trill sound, R, that becomes like a tap, R, R, when it's uh, spoken quickly and between vowels. Okay, so that's a feature of this language. And other thing is there are retroflex sounds. We know that the languages in the area have retroflex sounds, and most Australian languages do. Um, 
it's the sound there da da na la if you if you speak an indian language uh, or if you're familiar with with someone who has a very strong indian accent that are da 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 no those sounds are very very common in australia okay some languages actually it, it have almost like four or five different parts of articulation for stops uh, the the position so they have they've got a a, a da which is spoken with your tongue sticking out between your teeth da, there's a da which is an alveolar there's a da which is a palatal sound made by pressing your tongue against the bottom of your, uh, the, the bottom teeth and then raising the body da. and there's a da which is the retroflex and a ka. so that's five maybe six places of articulation uh, for stop so that's very very interesting and the problem is the orthography doesn't show this so we suspect actually Reverend Thrakal didn't know what he was right what he was hearing he couldn't distinguish sounds we think he kept mixing up sounds and that we and we see this as well in in in, in the phonology which is why it is so difficult to reconstruct the phonology of the Awapaka language uh, the only way we can do it is actually by comparing with records of neighboring languages that were also on the verge of extinction by the late 19th century uh, but we can at least try to sort of hear you know we've got we've got a person on our team who is a native speaker of Walbury so which is a, a, another language in the same family spoken up north but uh, he's familiar with the sounds of it and it's very 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 important to have him with us because he can at least say okay this recording this is a duh, this is a duh, this is you know this is a duh. you can hear it clearly all right so Let's look a bit to the next slide. So uh, uh, observations of Thrakal's grammar and his lecture reveal a few interesting quirks. So vowel sounds, okay, most Australian languages have three vowels. Some have five, but that's up north. In the south, they tend to have like three vowels and some languages even have only two vowels, okay? So what happened was uh, we suspect that a lot of times when there's E or O written uh, in a word, it may actually have been an A Y or an A W. So it may have been uh, basically a, a vowel glide vowel, all right? Um, Australian languages also, second point, they lack voicing contrast, very important. So B and P, D and T, G and K, they, they don't really, they're not distinguished. So, so it, oftentimes they are allophonic variations. So a, a B can become a P when it's at the beginning of a word, ba, but when it's between vowels, it goes a ba, or, or when it's next to a nasal sound, it goes a ba. That's very common in, in Aboriginal languages. Um, we know that he distinguished, Reverend, that Thrakelt's work, he distinguished B uh, and no, it's sorry, it's a G and K, I think, in some words. For some reason, we think he's just mishearing or not understanding that these are actually allophones of the same language. Uh, there's no J in his orthography, which is very important because the palatal plosive, like I mentioned, with your tongue pressing against the lower teeth, that's a very important sound, very common sound in Aboriginal languages. Dja, dja, or dja, dja. Um, the closest language I can think of that has this sound in Europe would be Magyar, Hung Hungarian. Get a Hungarian to pronounce the GY sound. Dja. Um, it's very close to how they say in, in Australian languages. Okay, but, but but like I said, in in the in the um, translations of um, of the Bible and uh, and uh, other texts, the J sound isn't really written properly. So he might have uh, the 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 Thrakelt when he wrote this, he didn't really uh, realize that, that was a separate sound, perhaps you know. And then of course, most Australian languages, Aboriginal languages have at least two R sounds. Okay, so ra ra. Some languages like Warbury have three R sounds, a R, a R, and a R, a R, a R, a R, a R is a flap sound. It's, it's, it's found in languages like Hindi, where it's a Larga, Largi, the R, a R sound. Yeah, that, that is also found in Australia. Okay, and as I said before, uh, retroflex sounds are not distinguished in the orthography. And we'll look at it apparently uh, to the point where some people, when they, they study the text, previous researchers thought, okay, the language didn't have retroflex sounds. But we know that they, 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 the language probably did because the neighboring languages, the closely related ones that we have recordings of, right, from a slightly later date, they do have uh, a da, da, na, la sounds. So uh, it's very likely that this language does as well, did as well. Okay, so uh, this is a declension. Okay, so one of the things, as I said before, if you notice on the column page 14, when he has N, G, D, A, V, A, B, L, again, that's a very Latin. So we know that Thrakel had a very classical education. He was, he was taught Latin, Greek, probably Hebrew and Syriac as well, Aramaic. If you see in the Bible translations, he writes the word for God uh, as Eloi. So rather than create a new word or you know, use a word that comes from Syriac Aramaic, uh, basically. So from the declension that you see here, what happens is if you notice the uh, the, the word for man, which is kuri, kuri, 
we believe it's a R, not a R. He, he writes it sometimes as a R, double R, sometimes as a single R in some text. So, so this is another problem. Uh, there are two ends, two nominatives. There are two datives, and there are four ablatives. And the vocative looks exactly like the nominative, except with a particle in front. So what, what basically he's trying to do is he's trying to fit the very, very different grammar structure of our bokal into a Latin or classical Greek sort of grammatical uh, template. And that we find is actually the problem because he, he uses this a lot um, in his grammar. So that, that, that is interesting. You're trying to fit a, a, a round a round nail into a square peg or a square peg into a round hole, whatever. So uh, basically he's trying to fit something uh, in wholly different into something that he was familiar with, which I think is probably the worst thing a linguist could do. But anyway, this is a 19th century, early 19th century linguistics. As we know, it was at its infancy. So yes, so he, uh, he we can't really comment on the, the, the bungles and, and, and mistakes that he made along the way. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to this later on. Now, um, let's talk about the morphology. We know that from the from the descriptions of the grammar, Awapagal had a very, very unique uh, s uh, syntax. It is an ergative language, number one. We know this even just looking at a simple description of the case system and, and, and all that, we say, okay, this is ergative. It's split ergative. And not only that, there's a change, that there's a difference between nouns that are common nouns, like, like man, uh, dog, uh, tree, versus proper nouns. So nouns are marked for ergative. They, are, they, they function a bit like Basque. We'll look at it in the later slides. I'll show you what it means if you don't know what ergative means. Uh, pronouns are nominative, accusative. So they function like English, I, me, that kind of thing, exactly like in, in European languages. And proper nouns are tripartite. They have tripartite marking. And this is a very rare feature, but it is found in Australia as well. What this typological feature means is that proper nouns have a split between the ergative, which is the agent of a transitive verb, the absolutive, which is uh, the, the actor of an intransitive verb, and the accusative, which is the object of a, trans a transitive verb. So we'll, we'll look at this later. It sounds very complicated. I know it is, but we will um, see some examples of this in the, in the next few slides. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go slow down a little bit. Okay. First things first, what is the ergative case? So the ergative case is the subject of a transitive verb. Okay. Uh, the subject of an intransitive verb and the object of a transitive verb are unmarked. Or known as the absolutive. A lot of languages are like this. One of them, classically, is Basque. Very typical Basque is very, very ergative. Another example would be Hindi in the past tense. If you can conjugate a Hindi verb correctly, or Urdu verb correctly in the past tense with all the genders correctly, then you kind of know how an ergative language behaves, basically. L let's take a look. Okay, so for Basque, if we say a sentence, so I've marked the yellow is the absolutive, and the red would be the ergative. So Maria Erorida. So Maria Erorida means Marie, Mar Marie has fallen. Okay. And there in, in, in Basque, when you have a, a, a subject that is of an intransitive verb, so Maria does something basically, but not, she didn't do something to us, something else. She just did something, uh, an intransitive verb like to fall. Basically, there's no object is the subject. It's Maria. Okay. If I would say Maria has seen Sarah, it's Maria Sara Ikosidu. So when you say Maria, Maria with a K because Mary, Maria is the one doing the action to Sarah. So Sarah is the one that's being looked at. And then the word ikusido is the verb to see, saw in the, in the past. So Maria has seen uh, Sarah. So Maria has a K, has a K sound to show that that is the ergative. Now, a lot of Australian languages, including Awabakal, has have this very, very similar, if not identical structure. Okay. So this is from our, our book. This is actually from the actual text that the, 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 the sentence structure, the sentences I'm showing you now are, were written in 1824, 25. Okay. So, we say, we're not sure whether it's new or new, but it's, it's, it's likely new. The bird, the bird eats it. So you see the bird, which is the word for bird is tibin. Tibin has a do. Uh, a TO's right at the end, and that shows it's the ergative, it's the subject of a transitive verb. So it is the bird is eating something. Versus the second sentence, which is tibin danua, or tibin danua unung, which means that is a bird. 
Okay, so it's an intransitive uh, uh, sentence that there is no object. It's just, you know, that is a bird or a bird is that, literally. So that's why Jibin has no marking. Okay, we'll look at more examples as we go along. Okay, so another feature that is our vocal, our, our vocal here has a very uh, and unique new properties, the tripartite structure. Here we go. So proper nouns plus the words who, where, and what have a triple system, a tripartite alignment. So if you look at the word in English, an English sentence would be Maria has fallen. Maria, marked in yellow, is the absolutive. It's the subject of, a tran of an intransitive verb, has fallen. Maria has seen Sarah. Maria, being the ergative, is red. I mark it as red. So all ergatives in, in the next few pages will be red. All absolutives will be yellow and accusatives, if they exist, will be blue. Okay, so Maria has so so in 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 our book, all these three the, the two Marias and Sarah will have different case markings to show them. So the subject of a transitive verb, the object of a transitive verb, and the subject of an intransitive verb all have different cases. Okay, yes. Uh, if you are not confused, <laughs> I will show you some more examples. So. This is one. So, so in, in a sentence like this, who art thou? Again, this was written in the 1820s. So, so the English is 1820-ish. Who art thou? I am Biraban. Ngan gibi ngadua Biraban. Okay, so ngan gibi. So ngan in this case, who are you? Who is, is, is it, it's part of an intransitive statement. Therefore, it is unmarked. Biraban, no suffix. So that's 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 also the absolute I am Biraban. If I say, however, ngandu bon tura, Okay, like who speared him and Biraban to Bontura, Biraban speared him. Okay, so Ngandu here, who has the word to, the T O suffix at the end, that is the ergative, it's the action. Okay, who speared him, all right? And then the Biraban to means Biraban speared him. So the Bontura part means literally um, speared him or her or it, basically. Um, the last example, Ngandung Tura, Birabanung, is like, who got who is speared who is speared this is this is the actual sentence or whom did he it can be who got speared or whom did he spear so who received the action pirabannung so this would be the accusative case uh you know in 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 a european language okay that is marked with the nung or nung suffix all right uh yeah so let's go on Another feature of, of the language that we know we know uh, exists. So this is an interesting thing. So so even without any elaborate uh, modern linguistic vocabulary, Threlke was able to describe very accurately what we now know to be a, a feature in many Australian languages, and that is the second position auxiliary. Okay. So many languages from the Pamunjungan family, so the the the, the big yellow uh, in the map of Australia with all the languages in yellow, a lot of the languages have what's called an auxiliary. Basically, the second word or the second phrase in a sentence gives you information about the, the pronouns, who is doing what to whom. All of that gets crammed into the second word in a sentence. So the word nando bontura, birabanto bontura, the bon part means someone did something to him because verbs are not conjugated. So Australian languages, in, in, in most of the languages of the Pamanungan family, verbs have no conjugation. So who, how do we know who is doing what to whom? It's all stuck into the auxiliary in the second position of the word, okay? And the weird thing is all the, the, the pronouns that are stuck in there are nominative accusative. They function just like in European languages, I love you, you hit me, that kind of thing, just like in European languages. So you have at least three different types of syntactic alignments of running around in the same sentence. And this is actually, believe it or not, very, very typical in Australia. So, yes, uh, if you don't understand, I will we'll probably have a question and answer session after this sometime. So we can, I'll give you more examples from other languages that are spoken, still being spoken today. And we, we can, we can you know, sort of sort through them and see how it, uh, it differs from European languages or Asian languages. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. Okay, so in a, in a question, like in a sentence like this, Tirang bang kutan. See, awake I remain, which is the way how they say I am awake. The word I stays in the second position. All right. Now, uh, a, a lot of the sentences in 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 uh, our book are very very likely they have free word order. You can literally say kutan bang tirang. You can you can swap them around in any way you want, except that the auxiliary, the 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 the, the part that shows the pronominal information, is always in the second position. So warai bang unulin. A spear I am now making, 
Okay, this is the actual sentence I'm, I'm, I'm taking up from the from the 19th century text. So I'm making a spear, the word for spear in yellow, which is the uh, absolutive case. Bang, which means I do something, the subject. Unulin is to make. So, and if you go down, the next sentence, bun kyun bun bang, the, 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 that, that, that cluster, bun bang, means him, I do something to him. And you put a verb in front, okay, because it, it has to be the second word in a sentence, all right? And then the others, and the, the, below that, there's the word powil bang patinung, uh, literally means I wish to beat Patty. Now, this is this is actually from an actual sentence recorded by uh, Threlkeld, and the sentence was this statement was made by Biraban. Patty is his wife, Biraban's wife, uh, her European name, but uh, she she's also from the one of the uh, from the uh, 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 uh mob or tribe. Now. You might think this is a bit disturbing, but in the 19th century, uh, in Australian society, apparently this is normal, as well as even in European society. I think in in, in the early uh, 18th century, um, uh, yes. So don't be don't be shocked. Uh, we we find sentences like this every now and then cropping up. So you know, uh, yes. All right. Uh, now moving along, Nandu ja Murun Umunun. Uh, who will save me alive? Literally, that was the sentence. Okay, I, I guess it's who's going to save me and keep me alive. Um, so you see the word who, Ngandu, is marked with the ergative. The tia is me, that's me in accusative. And the moron umunun is, is a, a, a verbal uh, complex, basic a compound verb. So who will save me alive? So so you see the, the pronouns function nominative and accusative, just like in English or German or other European languages, or like in Arabic, nominative and accusative. But the uh, question words function with the tripartite system and the common nouns have ergative, absolutive. Yes, uh, yes, you, it, t it took us a while to sort this out, but it's, it's incredible. So the verb, okay, we believe that the, the, the verb that, that uh, Threlkeld translated, all those verbs, are correct to a certain extent, but we also knew that he, he had it. So these are all the different forms of the verb. Uh, interestingly, in, in Walbury, the word for to hit is pun or pungu or pinyi. And if you notice, a lot of the uh, Aboriginal languages actually have the word pun, bin, for the word to hit. So that, that, that's actually a cognate. So we know that this is the, the stem is correct, but we are not sure regarding the suffixes, whether he got them correct or not, because um, I, I, I didn't I didn't actually show you the, 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 the next few pages. He created an entire parad uh, all different paradigms and different complex auxiliaries and participles with different, you know, different, different suffixes, which we know were not used in the neighboring languages and related languages. So we believe that he may be a case of linguistic, uh, is it a, a prescriptive or, 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 you know, descriptive grammar. He might have been actually created his own ad hoc forms in order to translate the Bible. So that's basically what, you know, we, um, yeah, that's basically what we find in a lot of the the, the, the Bible translations uh, that he did. And and fact, this is fact. Uh, one year, two years, three years after he started preaching to the Awabagal, nobody, hardly uh, nobody, joined his congregation. That's right, Threlkeld, uh, his mission was considered a failure because none of the Aborigines, you know, uh, wanted to join his church. And the reason was because they did not understand his translation of the Bible. When he gave sermons in our book, when he read it out, nobody understood what he said. Okay, so that's a clue. That's a very important clue that he might have messed up uh, uh, somewhere along the way with things like the verbs and pronunciation and spelling and all that. So, yeah. Okay, so some problems that we have. So uh, we, we talked about this. So the, the problems that we have with this text, for example, there is a feminine singular uh, subject, bundua, which is not found in other Pamanungan languages. We, we suspect he might have actually created his own feminine pronoun, uh, she, so, she can, he could, so that he could translate parts of the Bible with male, female characters. We know that this is an anomaly because Aboriginal languages are usually very, very symmetrical. So the pronouns are always singular, dual, plural. And it goes like this. So the feminine, the feminine pronoun that that he that we think is, is an invention only exists in the third person singular. She, uh, they, the two of them, and, and 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 three or more. There is no feminine form. We so in in the text, so we suspect that actually he created it just for the you know the equivalent of she. 
uh, there's also a lack of inclusive exclu exclusive distinction in the first person plural. Though we just like in in Malay Indonesian in Tagalog in in uh, even colloquial Mandarin war Mandarin, like there there are two words for we we and you and we and other people most. The, the, the vast majority, in fact, of Australian languages have this distinction, except our Bagal. So we suspect that he might have missed it out along the way somewhere. And the third thing is all the complex tenses with suffixes. There are a lot of suffixes in the verbs that don't really quite make sense. So we're still trying to sort out which ones are actually the verbs, uh, part of the verb, which ones are actually sort of participles or, or other words that he's just he's crammed together in order to translate things like the English uh, 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 past perfect or something <laughs> that, the, that there's no equivalent of in the language. Okay. All right. So now uh, almost to the end. So comparisons with living Bamanyungan languages. So this is an example from uh, an actual language that's still spoken today in, in the Northern Territory. It's related to our Bakal, uh, a, a, a somewhat distant relative, but there are a lot of cognates as well. So this sentence is Chabadangalu ka walu yarpirni. Okay, so Chabadanga is a princess name. It's a skin name, uh, a, uh, a name, right? Uh, well, it, it, you could have an entire lecture just to explain what a skin name is. But anyway, think of it as a name. The lu, the R L U after the, the word Chabadanga is actually the ergative marker. It shows that he's the one doing the action. The ka in the second position again, second. That's actually an auxiliary that shows present tense. A third person subject singular is doing something to a third person object singular. So he is doing something to it or she is doing something to it. Okay. Uh, as I said, there is, there is no gender distinction. So the, the, the okay. So as in, in many languages in the Palma Newman family, no gender distinction. And that warlu means fire and yarburni, yarburni means to, to kindle, to make a fire. So fire is unmarked, is the absolutive because it's the object and yarburni is to make. Now the word order is completely free. You can, you can rearrange the sentence any way you want as long as the auxiliary stays in the second position, the second word. So it's warlu ka yarburni japanangalu, uh, yarburni ka warlu japanangalu, uh, japanangalu uh, ka yarburni warlu. All right. Um, I'm, I'm speaking a bit fast, but that's how they, that's actually how uh, the language goes. The, the, a lot of Aboriginal languages are spoken very, very quickly, you know, very quickly and it glides across the tongue. Um, vowels are very, very short. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. So that we can, let's go to the next slide. Um, another example, I, I'm using a, a very, very, uh, a bookish example. Uh, okay. So, Ngajulurlu Karnangu Nyundu Nyanyi. I see you or I am seeing you. This is when this is not normally how people say it because because as I said as I said before, all the pronominal information is crammed into the auxiliary. So you can drop the pronoun. So the Nyaju Lu is I Lu, it's the R L U marks it as the uh, ergative. So I am doing something. The Karnangu means I do something to you. Okay? Nyundu is you. It has no suffix because it is the uh, absolutive, it is the object of the verb, nyanyi, to see. So, I see you. All right. Again, because the word order is free, you can rearrange it any way you want. You can say, or more, more, more commonly, you can even say, that's it. So, which means see. Are you so so the, the 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 verb to see stays at the beginning and then the the auxiliary which shows that I do something to you comes after that the one in green okay and so basically what I did is all the reds in in on this page mark the ergative the yellows mark the absolutive whites are the verbs and the greens are actually uh, the uh, auxiliary okay basically all right. Um, Oh, I'm sure you have many questions. Let's save it for the question answer session later on. Okay, so so I think that's it for me now. Um, if you're interested to learn more, actually you can visit Miroma. So Miroma is the the the, the NGO that I I I uh, am a consultant with at the moment, and we are working very hard to sort of unravel. Uh, the documents from the, 19, the early 19th century translate the, the, the translation of the Bible in order to resurrect the language to create a grammar, phonology, everything. So we are about halfway through with the grammar. Phonology was still a bit behind as of today. Uh, it might change uh, anytime, you know, the, the, these things we never know. Um, and one of the ways we're doing it is we're comparing uh, the language with those of neighboring languages, as I mentioned before. So there are other languages spoken around that, that are either uh, that that most of them are actually actually also extinct or severely endangered. But we have records of them in in, in uh, either uh, recorded 
uh, samples of speech or in text so we can sort of break down the grammar and you know work our way backwards from there okay right I think that's it thank you very much um, if you want to keep in touch want to contact me have any questions um, this is my contact details. Uh, you can get in touch with me at brian at utalk.com. So I work for Utalk as well. Uh, where, uh, and uh, yes, we're actually the sponsors for the Polyglot. Uh, we're one of the sponsors for the Polyglot conference. And uh, we've got over 140 different languages to, 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 to choose from if you're interested in learning uh, these languages, including a few rare ones. We, have, we don't have any Australian languages yet, but that might change in the near future. Okay, um, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter as well, and I have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you can't remember the, 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 the YouTube URL, URL, just go to Instagram or my Instagram and my Twitter and you can get a link from there. So I, I talk a lot about uh, the languages of Southeast Asia, Austronesian languages, and also about a little bit about Australian languages as well uh, on my YouTube channel. Okay, I think that's it, and uh, bye for now.